and I'll probably hit record too if it's not already. Uh, okay, yeah, it looks like it's already recording. Okay. All right. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Well, this is our subcommittee uh, to focus on action planning for the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, and um, welcome anybody who is attending along with us. And uh, if you, I believe, if they want to be heard uh, or want to submit a comment, they can just raise the hand. Correct, Rob? Um, that sounds good. Yeah, and as of now, we have no attendees uh, in the okay. room. I can um, maybe I'll just welcome folks and uh, let let you all know if if folks show up. Yes, that would be great. Cool. All right. Yeah. Yeah, we can see we them ask. too, actually. So. And you? Okay. Sure. Right. Given that sure. we're panelists, we can see them. If we were attendees, we would have no idea what was there. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Sometimes, though, if there are other people, I don't see the screen. I just see I see us right now. But often, when we run the meeting, half the people are not on my vision and then when they have the hands up they can't even see the panelists with a hand up so um but the other thing is just for recording sake also to ask for people's names because sometimes it's just the first name and i know when we do minutes um you like to have their full names so do somebody do we have to call this meeting to order or something since it's a subcommittee the meeting is called to order right now the people who are present are uh I'm Carol. Everybody else say their name. Carol Lewis, one of the Eric, people. Erica Pinedad. <laughs> Rob Crowder. Shelly Garing. And Greg Rasheen. Okie dokie. All right, so we can start. <clears throat> so what do we do now? Yeah. We have Shelly's well, notes. We have some suggestions that Grover made. We have whatever all of us have thought about. Shelly, can you help us out? Mm -hmm. Yep. So thank you so much, Greg, for sending these these um, documents out. I, I'm hoping that everyone kind of has them available to them to to um, review. Um, and then he, Greg helped fill out some of just my notes where I tried to do themes. And then Greg added a little added some to that as well to build it out a little bit. So I was doing it based on themes just because I'm trying to focus in on some potential goals for the trust. And then Grover's really focused on kind of one goal and then put a lot of things under it, which I would actually pull some of those items out as goals. But I, I wanted to start with a conversation of um, kind of your takeaways from the meeting and some key things that you are hearing as trust members. If there are certain things that really stand out as kind of that appear to be particular priorities just from the conversation. I can start. <clears throat> Um, so I think what I've heard uh, pretty clearly, a couple of things. One is the more concrete, which I think Grover sort of gave good examples of, which is being clear about um, our goals for increasing affordable housing. Um, and she didn't separate rental from um, or, or transitional housing, rental from home ownership. Um, but that, you know, I, I believe we all believe in all those uh, possibilities. Um, so I think, you know, being impactful to actually get uh, affordable housing online, that's one of the areas. And also for people under 100% AMI, um, individuals, uh, seniors, families seem to be a priority in people with disabilities, which would then include um, many people who are homeless. Uh, as well, getting them into housing. So that's that's one thing that I thought was important because it was more concrete in terms of description. And then, of course, the type of housing being uh, innovative in terms of ADUs or other types of housing, co-sharing. Um, so really being uh, cognizant of the, ver the the different types that we could actually promote. So that's one area. The other area was um, being very clear about um, what resources we have and our ability to uh, leverage them and move them forward. So you have your big goal, but you also have to look at the limitations and the resources. And then the last thing that I thought was really important is there were a couple people who had something very specific and, um, and just being paying attention that it seemed to me that um, what I was hearing, and, and you can correct me, is that this is something that they're very committed to. And if we don't include that, that there might 
I may be wrong, that they might not be as committed. <laughs> so so I, I think it's really important to pay attention to some people's specific uh, interests to make sure that that's incorporated. So I heard that the comment as kind of, um, because I kept saying like, start with the data and the response is, but we need to be, we need to feel really compelled by what we're doing or we won't be as motivated. So I was kind of hearing it kind of from that angle. I, I do think that it's a fair point that you, the trustees need to feel motivated and um, really on board with what goals you choose and strategies. So Um, yeah, so, that. yeah, I want to jump in mm -hmm. on that. Go ahead. So, so um, my takeaway from, from the meeting last, whatever that was, a couple weeks ago, um, in the spirit of, of Shelly's uh, recommendation to like try and pick two areas, two points, two goals, my takeaway of what those what the broad goals were that people were expressing were um, more units, just more units, and and then there are, you know different ways that you could achieve that, as Shelley has here, low income housing, um, senior housing, accessible units. Those are those are possible ways to get more units, but just more units was was I saw as the goal, and the other goal was addressing the the market situation umass um you know that in particular umass and, and how that uh, impacts the market how it impacts anything that we might try to do and you know as as you know i said I, i'm skeptical of our ability to actually influence umass so I, so i i don't know how to um fulfill that goal but i but i do recognize that it did seem to be a, a goal that people were a lesson yeah yeah uh i guess i would i also heard a lot about dissatisfaction or wishing for something better with the interact with the relationship between the town and especially umass but maybe also the other colleges in town that seems something that people felt was problematic and needed work even though it also seemed clear that it should not be it's not the trust thing to lead but it might be the trust it's kind of it might be the trust to like poke at someone who should be leading it a little bit to to and to do something that was collaborative with us and the planning board and paul and who knows whatever else i just heard a lot of um that that's a, I think mostly that that's a barrier that our lack of being able to be c kind of in concert with UMass and have them take seriously the problems of housing there, or they probably do take them seriously, but not involving us in what they're thinking. I don't know. It just seemed like a thing that was a barrier. And, and the other thing, units, 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 but also some interest in how can we make sure that the units that already exist are actually occupied? What are are there things that we might be doing that are not? It might not take so much money. It's building a unit or renovating unit or whatever in order to just what could how could we be helpful in uh, making the units that already exist more avail more actually be utilized? Um, but. Units, 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 and and people. I heard different, you know, like maybe they should be eld units for elders. Maybe they should be units for families. Maybe they should be units for below even eighty percent of median. Maybe they should be units for one hundred to one hundred and twenty percent of work for it units. So I, that just seems so all over the place. Shelley, I don't know if you know this, but we have a very good chance of having a million plus dollars given to us soon. I don't know whether you I read the article. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, 
So um, the one thing with UMass is, so I, I had appreciated Rob's concern during the meeting, but then when Paul said, he's the guy, like he's the person that should be driving the relationship. And I thought, oh my gosh, you have the person right on your board. Like it does feel like you could have some influence because it, it does seem like it's trying to push the town to make it more of a priority to be building this relationship with UMass and putting some pressure on the state to do more. So that actually, when he said he's the one, I thought, that feels way more doable to have some influence in that. I was also surprised because he actually said something about UMass when it was his turn to talk. He said they have they have property or I forget exactly what he <laughs> said, but he didn't seem he didn't seem to be saying leave this alone. I want to do it by myself or anything. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, he might want some pressure because to make it more to prioritize it more like he might need some pressure to do that. He's got his gazillion things on his plate. So, yeah. So I, I found that really actually promising, particularly if they do have land. I mean, that's the the possibility of a land donation is to me so, so interesting and very promising. I mean, promising might be too optimistic, but. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think, um, I think Paul is the guy, right? If there is some, you know, uh, But I think also, and I think Paul would probably tell us this, just because he would be the, the person in Amherst to relate to UMass doesn't mean UMass has to listen to him, right? I mean, he, he, he you know, I mean, on a matter like this, right? Like, um, you know, it's not as if he has a regulatory oversight of them really at all, um, you know? That, so I think that's, but I, just speaking to what Rob shared, I think for me, it's, it's help like Rob, what you said specifically about, I think you just said market concerns, you know, and of course, like UMass animates that market, you know, in a, in a big, big way. But I think for me, thinking about it in terms of the market makes it feel a little more like something that the trust can, can grasp in some way, rather than, I think it would be easy to fall into sort of UMass combat. And I, and, and I, Rob, I, I understand your, your, your reservations there. And I share them as far as like, we're not a community organizing entity, you know? Um, and um, I, I think, and I think some of our members certainly come from that space, you know, I mean, my YouTube kind of, but not here, you know, I mean, so I think um, just sort of navigating that I think is key. And I think like talking about the market as a whole is to me, conceptually opens more doors than this big blob of, of UMass that's, you know, because I think there, there's also a a vulnerability or a threat here of like UMass is also the reason not to do anything in, in the eyes of a lot of community stakeholders, you know, so we have to sort of be mindful of not reinforcing that. Sure. So I just wanted to say, um, you know, I, I like that concept of market because I, I had heard it a little broader, such as um, uh, corporate investors coming in and buying up um, homes. Um, and you know, how, do, how can we think about countering something like that? Uh, and, you know, I, I know, again, these are just brainstorming, but one of the things is you know, how many people who are selling the homes know that there might be an alternative, um, such as, you know, working with the um, Amherst Community Land Trust or, you know, us trying to see if we can match somehow, not unreasonably in terms of investors, but, you know, having people think, you know, there are people who love Amherst and who might want to sell to a family. And we haven't, you know, really done enough of that um, to, to, you know, put it out there. So that would probably be about the educational piece. But then the other piece around market is um, having heard um, Gabrielle and, uh, you know, represent um, Barry Roberts and his interest in really increasing bed capacity and home ownership here, not necessarily affordable, but that, you know, it's a piece of under inclusionary zoning. Um, you know, are there other developers who we can sort of get to increase the investment of, of creating more beds? Um, because I think what I've heard is with more rental spaces, it puts less pressure on, you know, people renting homes. Um, and I, actually, this is really weird, but I've actually seen more houses for rent in Amherst that are generally student 
uh, rented. So I don't know what's going on right now. It could be a blip, um, but I've seen more of that right now than I've seen any time before uh, in the past few years. But explain that to me. What do you mean? That there's... More- yeah, so there's signs out. Yeah, there's signs out right now. So um, there's a whole area that's all student rental here. And so I've seen more of those houses that are generally student rental houses have for rent on them. And I don't know if it was a small blip because UMass just, um, you know, increased their uh, private partnership, you know, big old dormitory space out on campus. But um, it, it just is really weird that I've seen homes. These are homes that are generally rented by students. And you can see, you can you know, I've seen tons of cars there every year, and now there are signs for rent um, for those. And they're people. available, which suggests that the students are renting in apartments. Something else, yeah. yeah. Somewhere else, yeah, I somewhere see. else. But they're but they're investor owned, so then that's why they're available for rent. They came in, or what are those other corporations oh. that are here in Amherst that do all the management of these rental spaces? That's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that feeds into the housing production plan process. Hopefully, you know, that observation, that's I'll make a note of that. Um, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. You know, I would, I, what I would love in terms of data is having a map, a GIS map of places that are, I mean, I don't know how, how we could even do that, but, you know, of the places that are rented out, these are, you know, home structures that are rented out and these are, you know, um, rental apartments that are rented out to see um, what's actually available. And these are home owned. Um, it would really be very interesting. But I mean, they're, they're usually pretty high density areas where students live. So you can usually, you know, note if it's if it's a home um, or if it's student student rentals, because you see multiple cars there, even though there's not supposed to be more than four people, unrelated people renting, you often see six or five or whatever. Hmm. So that's the rule in Amherst, is it's no more than four unrelated people? That's my understanding. Mm-hmm. Probably why Robert has things with four bedrooms and not yeah. five. Yeah. <laughs> it's not right. in, it's just well, random. Well, random isn't quite right, but it's certainly not strictly enforced, that rule. Yeah. I mean, um, it, that would be so, take so much effort to do that. Yeah. Well, and yeah. to some extent, if you do it, all it's going to do is put more pressure on things because then the place where there's six people can't have six anymore, then you need more places for students. So. It's kind of, in a way, self-defeating, except for the neighbors who think that it's horrible. So I don't know. Well, most municipalities are reactionary. They they respond to complaints. They don't respond to being proactive. So, yeah. <laughs> because they don't have the resources either to you know to inspect. Uh, I mean, that was the whole thing with the town council wanting to do more inspectional for rental spaces, and there was a big up in arms against that. But I was going to say there. I mean, I just heard three things: uh, more units. I think we all agree on that, um, and that's really expansive because it has lots of different pieces to it in terms of. Uh, who we prioritize, as well as um, existing units, um, and then also relationship. Okay, and then the second one was addressing the market situation, um, trying to possibly increase more home development, be it rental, uh, transitional housing, or uh, home ownership. And then the last one, I think, was real realistic, r- making sure that we're realistic in terms of the resources we have. Did I get that or did yeah, I miss so it? I, I'm I would... it? Development, funding, and market pressures. So the same kind of three key areas. Yeah. That leaves out something that I thought we talked about, but that seems important to me, which is land. Well, so I think that's well, maybe that's, that's part of maybe that's part of units, but yeah. but the whole subject of where is there land that could be housing and who develop who develops it? But is it at UMass? Is it what about whatever land Amherst owns that it hasn't got a plan for or that it does have a plan for or something. I mean, I kind of like the thing that um, Grover suggested that says that, you know, if you have some surplus land, you have to see if it's available, if it's you, if it could be viable for affordable housing before you do anything else. 
And Hello. I like that at the same time that I know that the town desperately needs a new DPW and desperately needs a new fire station. And at probably roughly the same kind of land that you could build all those things on. So then that gives me pause. But something that gets affordable housing into the mix every time there's land in some way, I think that's a valuable thing to work for, too. It's kind of mimicking what the governor is doing right now around state land is prioritizing affordable housing. So I, I, I really like that too. But I think that some of that can go under development. So I think it can be a strategy under development to pursue that potentially. So under de development, meaning more units, is that yeah. what you mean by development? Okay, so the yeah, development exactly. strategy, more units, one of the ways to get them might be more land or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay, that's fine. As long as it's there yeah. somewhere. Yeah. No, so I think that, um, because the way that Grover organized it, I would I would pull, do a few broad goals, not just the units, and then a lot of the things that she puts as tactics can fit under I think a few broad goals. And because you're you're I think that you have enough capacity where you could focus on three goals just fine. You don't have to bring just two, um, and then just have a variety of strategies, and then just kind of be thinking about timeline of what are the things you start first. And so I think that that's really doable. And to me, these are kind of the three key things that came out of the meeting too. I, I think that we're on a similar page. And Shelly, how, how are you framing them again? Just, just so you're, you're saying development slash units and then funding for the trust. Okay. And then like market pressures. So, I mean, uh, I can maybe work with you on kind of some language to build that out a little bit as sure. Well. Okay. okay. But just kind of really, really general. And then I think that we start, like, I think the work that Grover did is fantastic. And I think that we work on, start moving some of those into strategies under these goals. And I think that, I think this is a, we've only, we've only been meeting, talking for 22 minutes, which is amazing. We've gotten so much work done. I actually was afraid it was going to take longer. So <laughs> it feels really good that things are starting to coalesce. Um, I, I would just want to, I just want to push back a little bit on the prioritizing of seniors, people with disabilities and families, because really the only people I think that that's leaving out are single people who are not yet seniors. They don't have a disability, but they're likely part of the workforce, low income. So I just would kind of, I know that, I know that people are really drawn to those three categories, but when you think about who it's leaving out, it's oftentimes young people in our communities, we're losing young people because our communities are so expensive. So oftentimes people are that are working because they don't apply, they can't, um, they don't receive disability insurance. So I just would, would just, I just want to put on the table of let's think about who we're leaving out when we get that precise about those three groups. Paul said that in the, in the, um, in our meeting said, you know, there's a lot of single people who, I mean, he made, he made the same point. Yeah. In a more, a more recent meeting that we, the, the more recent trust meeting when we talked about the in lieu. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know what, uh, is there a way to, uh, and we don't have to think about this right now, but I'm thinking, is there a way that when opportunity arises, so for example, you know, with Craig's door, um, we were able to focus on individuals who are homeless and we were able to subsidize their rental space or with, um, you know, Valley, we were able to do the RSOs for people who um, were homeless or, um, you know, were experienced, came from shelters or had, um, you know, uh, needs around um, disabilities. So I think with, without stating that, but when there are opportunities to make sure that, you know, we, we jump on those opportunities, um, you know, when there, when there's such opportunities available without saying specifically that we'll leave anybody out, we're looking for the most vulnerable and the most vulnerable include individuals who are just trying to make it on a day-to-day -day basis. I might propose that we that we not have that kind of language in the goal piece, but that we have guidelines for the trust and that maybe we have priority funding projects or something where we highlight that, but maybe not specifically in the goal language. Maybe we don't get quite that detailed. Okay. I think AMI, so really highlighting some AMI, that's important because that that's directly speaks kind of funding. But I'm not sure that I would get quite as um, I think that some of what she put on and some of what I think some of your sensitivities maybe could fit better in a different category in the trust guidelines. Yeah, because a lot, 
a lot, it depends on what the possibilities are. I mean, if you had a guideline where we want to fund families, that would be terrible if it made you decide not to fund the 132 Northampton Road thing because, oh, that's all individuals. So that would be horrible. You don't want to be in that place at all. So, yeah. Well, and of course, you have a really great downtown, a lot of businesses. Chances are that it's a lot of single people that are a lot of the employees. So we just, I don't think you want to lose sight of that, just given how important that um, your, your commercial kind of retail space is in your community. Good point. Yeah, I mean, I think family pro like household profiles maybe is a, a general term. You know, we should probably be cautious about being too prescriptive. I, I would agree with that. But I, an area where I'm curious, and Shelley, I, um, I, I, I'm curious by you know, so there's household profiles like families or singles or, you know, retired people or you know, whatever. But then there's also um, like AMI, like you said, you know, and I wonder, you know, and Grover has AMI targets here too, you know, and I, and it might be written down somewhere, but my experience of the trust has not been that we have a priority AMI target, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, and, and I wonder if we should, if I, if I look back at our last several years of, um, you know, of, of funding, you know, uh, you know, targeted, you know, ELI um, through the Valley Project, you know, this upcoming Wayfinders thing, which we put a lot, if you include the land disposition process, we put a lot of effort into the um, the Wayfinders Project, which will be, uh, you know, a mixed, you know, tax credit, you know, 30 up to 80, up to market rate, actually, you know, so, you know, to subsidizing people coming off the street into rentals, you know, which is not, capital investment at all, you know, I mean, um, and then, and then the home ownership stuff, you know, uh, at, um, 70 with the land trust to 80 and a hundred with Valley. Um, and I, I, yeah, and I, I, and maybe it's okay to have that spread. I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm just like, should, you know, but should we have that discussion at the trust, you know, of, of what our priority is, or is, is that going to hinder us too much? Well, I would just say that um, we worked on creating an RFP for the, the for the Wayfinders project, and one one of the things that people were judged on in their proposals was having so many things at all at a variety of AMI levels. So, if we have done anything, in my knowledge of what we've done it has been to ask for a spread to ask for things not to be all the same but to be start at maybe 30 and even go up to 120 in different organizations of things but like i as i've said so many times i like to see a spread of incomes it's like more it's an important kind of diversity i think and I think that we have in some ways supported that, but we, since we haven't actually had any goals that we paid much attention to in a while, I haven't, I don't know what to say about that part, but we have embedded it in things that we've done. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I had actually had a similar thought as Greg did in that um, focusing on certain AMI targets or, or any other targets, does help you focus your your thought your action, but 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 historically we there's also a, a tendency and, and a um, desire to be opportunistic and like oh if we have a chance to do this you know we don't want to say oh oh um, because we've set our goals here and this other opportunity has come up we don't want to lose that opportunity so so there is a tension I, I agree with Greg yeah yeah and I I, I also um... You know, this is really an important conversation, but I also agree not to limit ourselves because sometimes the opportunities, I know we tend to be a little bit more reactive than proactive. I mean, our proactive is constantly pushing the town to give us land, to give us, us um, surplus spaces. Um, but, you know, often opportunities come up and, you know, we say, you know, we, we would like to see a spread. And I absolutely agree with um, Carol that um, I think it's important to have individuals with different incomes together. Um, it's been proven in terms of trajectory of, you know, moving upwards. Um, it, it really provides, you know, some people have more resources than others and help others. And, and I think that's really important. And so um, 
I think it's really important for us to also think about, you know, that that mix uh, to help that mix be either with income or with families or individuals or whatever. I think that diversity really um, creates more synergy among those who live together uh, as a community. So I think that's important. Um, I think, you know, we, we again, we have that euphemistic most vulnerable. <laughs> um, but I, I think, you know, that when an opportunity comes up, we think about that. And I agree with uh, Carol when we did the RFR, we were very, very specific that we were looking for that mix um, because we, we don't know how many people uh, working in Amherst can fit any of those mixes. And you know, part of it too is that you wanna make sure, and we actually put that in the RFR too, that once they're housed, that they have the support they need to stay housed. Uh, and for those who are uh, able to then, you know, make some extra income to then move to home ownership, if that's what they want. Um, so I think that that's really Im important um, to think about the mix. Can I ask a question, maybe of Shelley, um, focusing on on Grover's top line there how um important how useful is it to to put numbers on on things like like grover has um 300 units in five years 200 of which are this and 75 of this and 50 of those um is it is it important to be aspirational in our goal setting or, or realistic? You know, what's the balance? <laughs> 300 Good seems question. like a lot. That's, you know, 60 a year. And and so that means one um, Belcher Town Southeast Street every single year. Is that really possible? I don't even know. It doesn't seem like it. But, but yet we should have these aspirational goals. Yeah, I think that you just need to decide for yourself. I think that it should be a little bit aspirational. I think you you I think that we should be trying to stretch ourselves. The needs are so great, but I I also think that you don't want to make it demoralizing because it's so far. Right. So, you know, if it does feel really unrealistic. So, I think that that's something that you just need to discuss. So, I am she definitely got the message when I was trying to say smart goals really measurable. She really put in these numbers. I I think it's just a the trust just needs to decide how, if you want to be as prescriptive as she's been, or if you want to have language like Carol and Eric are kind of suggesting of um, really wanting to prioritize income diversity in the developments that you support. But I, I do like the idea of 300 or whatever the number is, new units over five years. I think that that's helpful to kind of light the fire a little bit to, and then it's really measurable. But maybe that number needs to be a little bit less. Uh, the trouble for me with the numbers is whichever one it is, I'm pulling out of my left ear because I have no idea what's possible. And unless we do some of the work to figure out where housing could be, some of the land work, some of the work with somebody else to find out what's available, but it, it's like, I don't know, I can say any number you want because they all seem equally the same. Unless I say two, then I think we can probably do it. But, but, but after that, it's really just made up. I have no basis, so. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I might, Michelle, you've been good about reminding us about the timing here and vis-a-vis -vis the sort of political landscape in Boston and, um, you know, and I, I, I guess I, I see, I think like an organizer, if we had a more aspirational goal, if we had, you know, if we had a stretch goal, <laughs> have you seen the term used before? It might help us sort of position ourselves in a useful way toward the the political and hopefully financial opportunity that we'd like to see coming down the pipe. And you know, it, it, presuming the housing bill passes, you know, there's going to be more resources in the state pipeline. Um, and I do think, you know, and Shell, you can say probably with much more authority, but it seems to me there's going to be a point at which the state is going to be looking for 
communities that are ready to go. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, there's there's still going to be more demand probably than there is resources, but but yeah, I guess I'm just thinking in terms of like you know, could, like could could a more aspirational goal kind of help us in relationship to the the broader environment, you know, of of finance and that we're seeking to leverage. So one thing in terms of AMI level, so I, again, might not be quite as prescriptive in the goals, but I might put it in the guidelines, or it could even be part of your criteria of that you would give extra kind of points or whatever to a development that, uh, unless unless you want to do, it did get brought up in the meeting of housing for less than 50% of AMI, because a lot of the affordable housing tends to be around the 80% AMI range. They're, they're often, or 60% with low-income housing tax credits. So like you might want to specify, I mean, Somerville is a community where it's actually in their bylaw that they have to spend a certain percent of their funding on housing below 50% AMI. It's like 30% or something. So that's really, that's reg now regulatory for them where they have to. I, I'm not suggesting anything like that, but if if they're feel it, getting kind of back to Carol's language of kind of most vulnerable, like maybe you do want to do a particular highlight of um, very low and extremely low income housing, maybe. But it, some of this more specific language could be in kind of priority funding cat preferences or your criteria as well in your guidelines. It doesn't all have to fit the goals could be a little bit more broad or just less prescriptive. One of the things that I hope will be a strategy under something or other is to try to, uh, it does seem in the state like a uh, good time to be pursuing such things and so Hopefully, one of our strategies will be to pay attention to what's going on there and see in what ways we might be able to support it, which we try to do anyway, but it could be part of a strategy or tactic, or I don't even know if I know the difference between those two things, but yeah. Well, I, I just would like to offer you that coming from one of the state agency, housing agencies, quasi-state agencies, Amherst has a great reputation. I mean, we look statewide and in terms of statewide and compared to a lot of other communities, uh, I think the view of Amherst is really favorable that you've done a lot on the housing front and it doesn't feel like it to you. You're in it every day. It's not near enough. You know, we need more everywhere, but um, your reputation is really strong. People know that you're that you're trying to do you know, the right thing, you're, you're moving forward. So I just want to offer that to you. Thank you. <laughs> That's good to hear. Yeah. And I think Carol, all what you said is um, under the development piece and under the funding piece, we could actually have strategies for like for under development um, uh, or under funding, you know, uh, continue our relationship with our representative, uh, state representatives, uh, is really, really important to get more, to, to see if they can push on the state level to find public land here in Amherst. Um, because I think, I don't know if the town's going to be able to push UMass, but I think, you know, from the state, there can be some, um, pressure on UMass. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, we, we can have, you know, the advocacy pieces as part of, you know, either the funding or, I mean, we're still, you know, advocating for the transfer fees. So that would be under the funding piece. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, so I think that, that those are really important strategies that might fit actually on, under both those areas. Yep. I definitely think bringing in your rep, your state reps and Senator from UMass is, if you want to try to get some land from UMass, I think that's. Definitely important. Yeah. So um, what if the next step is that Greg and I try to put some language to these before we meet again, and then you can decide if you want us to meet one more time before we go back to the full trust or whether I think it might be a little premature unless over email we do a little bit of work, but um, I think you can make that decision. So your next meeting would be, will we meet again before the April meeting? Actually, we might be meeting before the April. No, I don't think so. so. We, can. we can. Our April meeting is on the 11th. 
So, um, 18th. yeah, and our meeting would be the 18th, but we could. Um, so, uh, there is the 28th and there is the fourth, the fourth, we always have a meeting with the town, uh, as a planning, a pre-planning meeting, um, uh, with Nate, Greg, Dave, um, and we could piggyback off of that if possible, or we could do the 28th. Um, so whatever people suggest. So I think the fourth would be better for me, but why don't Greg and I put some draft language together and see how people are feeling about it. And if then it feels like a, a shorter meeting to review it in person or tweak it before you go, before we take it to the 18th, April 18th meet or April 11th meeting. Does, would that work? For me? We could um, do it. So if, if we were doing it on the fourth, we do it like after the usual meeting we have with the town. So like 12 to 1230 or something. Is that what you're suggesting or what people are, whoever is suggesting it is suggesting? I am not. Unfortunately, I, I, I am sending Nate in my stead on that on that meeting in the fourth. I'm traveling um, uh, that Thursday, Friday, unfortunately. So, OK. So I, I'll be offline. So hopefully we could avoid for this conversation. We could avoid that day if possible. Um, okay. Well, well, I mean, we could also but, do it like, sorry, on another day. Um, or what if we're your meetings on the eleventh at night? Could you do at ten o'clock, just or eleven yeah. o'clock, or like twenty I could. minutes? I could. Yeah, I think so. I can't. I that's the first day that I have company from out of wherever here, and I'm gonna come to the meeting at the night, but I can't do another one. Okay. Um, I think we might just be not meeting before our next meeting. To my guess. I mean, let's just try to do it know. by email. Let's. We let's can do it by email. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it by email. Okay. Well, I, I think that's a good idea. But I would, if it turns out to be too get gnarly in email, which sometimes things do, we can always say we're not ready yet. Yeah. So I just want to reserve that possibility. Okay. Because sometimes trying to do things by email becomes kind of a nightmare. I totally agree. Yes. Yeah. So if let's let's try, and if it just feels like we need to be meeting again, then we'll just push it to the May meeting. No, no problem. Yeah, that sounds good. Sounds good. I like that. Good. No urgency. Um, and just a reminder, we did also say that uh, once the trust members feel good about this, that we're going to go to the town council and possibly other committees, and then also open it up for public comments. So. We're yep. going to go to the town council with what? With well, I mean, I think what we said is maybe not go, but to also share with other committees like the town council, possibly the planning board, possibly CPA. You, you mean, Erica, when we have a completed action plan or? Yes. Well, well okay. completed to uh -huh. share, but not completed. That it's totally completed because we want to get engagement as part of. Gotcha. I see. So, so some sort of draft of it to, yeah. You know, I, I, I think maybe we're a ways away from. Oh yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to yeah, remind. I mean, we want to get the initial trust feedback and then, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Not yet. And I, the other thing to keep sort of at least aware of how it's going is the progress with the housing production plan, which I think they're still trying to find somebody to do it at the moment. But um, we should just like remember that we would like to not be at least contradictory to each other as we go forward so when yeah. Nate, Nate comes to the trust meetings he's on the is he on the trust or do he just comes to the meetings he comes to the meetings comes to the meeting. so he'll be in get he'll be a part of the conversation he'll as he's moving that process forward yeah and I'll, I'll be probably and, more involved right. in that than Nate even yeah. so I'll, I'll have my hand in both pots there yeah right. um make sure we don't trip ourselves up great all um, right so, that, this is not really about what we're talking about, but because I'm thinking of it, is the person who decide who is going to do the trust, the housing production plan, maybe some of us might get to meet with them to have say something about what we think should be in there before yes, the thing the, is the, finalized. So the housing production plan, once that's once the development of that is underway, the trust will be the because um, the trust is also the. Um, not the affordable housing affair, part, part, not the partnership, but whatever the housing and sheltering committee got kind of formally absorbed by the trust. And, and last time around, that was the, the sort of feedback body. Um, so, um, so the trust will be our main um, entity that will, will lean on 
pre, I forget if it has to go through the planning board or not, but yeah, the trust will be the brain trust basically behind it. And we wrote in meetings, uh, three to four meetings with the trust into that um, uh, solicitation in part, thanks to your, your feedback. So thank you. <laughs> but um, yeah. Okay, great. So. Thanks. I have one sort of back to this, the trust action plan. I have one question for Shelly about like how to think about something. Is it okay if I, you know, and I'm, so, you know, we, we have this dynamic, you know, and I, and I don't think it's necessarily problematic, you know, but just to think to monitor where, you know, applicants can both go to CPA, right. And then come over to us. Um, and right now ask, you know, ask for support from us as well. Um, that's a bigger thing to untangle it, 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 it maybe, or maybe not. Right. But I guess one, one of the questions that, that that's a process thing, which, you know, is, is a conversation of itself, but the sort of bigger thematic question it raises for me as the trust, you know, is uh, how do we, is there a way that we can incorporate criteria or planning where we're looking at things that wouldn't have happened either way, right? Meaning, I think, you know, like, like for example, right? Like Valley identified uh, that Valley is doing some home ownership with the Commonwealth Builder Program. Um, and I guess it's kind of Northish Amherst. Um, And they found the site, right? And they they obtained it, you know, like like developers do, and you know, and uh, you know, and and brought it to us. So and and Valley has both, I think, money from CPA and from us. I have to double check, um, you know, you know. But then you know, but then the the East Street School, you know, which is the the, the sort of Wayfinders project, which um, we just got a PEL letter for. You know, that is one where, you know, we identify the site and we kind of were the catalyst for the town to dispose of the site and put some affordable housing into it, get it over to us. And, you know, and so that I'm less confident that that one happens. Uh, in fact, probably that one doesn't happen without the trust being there up front. You know, should that kind of. You know, can, do, do you see trust incorporate that kind of question into their planning or into their work, meaning you know, prioritizing, you know, what's the stuff that's not going to happen without us? Mm. I see it more as a communication issue, unless I'm misunderstanding. Um, often Carol and I get asked to sign something without even knowing that it happened. <laughs> um, and, and so part of, you know, we have Nate on our, on our trust, we have Paul on our trust, and thank goodness now we have you, Greg, on our trust because we get more information from you. But, you know, things go up in front of the planning board, um, in front of the zoning board, and we've talked about having people on those, but it's just a lot, you know, being on mm -hmm. the trust and those boards just to always pay attention, see what's going on. I think it's a better internal communication. I think we need better internal communication about how to manage housing development or, um, you know, housing period in, in Amherst. Um, I know the town council gets reported to, uh, and they have a CRC committee. And so, I mean, I know one of the things, Shelly, you raised in, in your presentation is possibly the trust being more proactive in meeting with these other committees and setting up possible communication guidelines or um, at least just, uh, I mean, I, I love the fact that the planning committee asked us for advice. I mean, that was great that they asked the trust, what do you think about payment in lieu of, you know, of these affordable um, units? They could have made a decision without us, but to really set up that relationship that, you know, we haven't really, I believe, had. Um, and, you know, we, we hear things like, you know, Allegra told us, oh, the town council is reviewing the um, land policy for Amherst. Well, why didn't we know about that? You know, I mean, we have Paul on our committee, um, on our trust, uh, you know, so I think it's, it's, I think it's a better internal communication and collaboration. And it's something that we have to think about how to do better. Um, I, I, I'll take responsibility that as, as a co-chair, pushing a little bit more on, on how to better do that. You might want to put on your agenda time to specifically ask Paul and 
Nate, other staff of things going on because what, what I've seen a lot with CPCs, community preservation committees is it's really interesting. Like there are, there's an appointee from the planning board. There's an appointee from the housing authority from all these different boards. And it oftentimes feels like they take CPC information back to their boards, but they don't bring their board's information to the CPC. So it's, it's a really strange, it oftentimes feels like a strange one-way relationship. And I, I wonder if that sometimes happens um, with the trust too, where you have these people that would have information, but maybe it goes out more than it comes in. And maybe it's trying to set up, a, get into a habit of creating space for that information to come in and an expectation that the information come in because it, it's not good if you're kind of operating in a vacuum. Like that's not what we want. We want you to right, be exactly. in the midst of every, you know, in relationship with everything else. Yeah, and I'm getting ahead, getting ahead of myself a lot, but thinking about the housing production plan, I think that's absolutely a, a strategy we could put in there, which goes beyond the trust because it gets to, you know, communication structures uh, across all these bodies, not just the trust, you know, and I think, you know, the trust can help be a catalyst and an advocate for that. Um, but, I, but ultimately, I think it's, you know, it, it's not all or shouldn't all be on, on this body. It's partly um, why well, I have appreciated um, Brewster has put a staff person on their trust board and it's, it's a little bit unconventional, but, um, I think that it helps a lot because she's the assistant town manager. And so she knows everybody and she's just always engaged with different boards. So there's a, a good, I think back and forth and, but having Greg present and Greg engaged in other meetings like that can also help facilitate some of this. Um, so and yes. And Nate has Nate has provided that for us mm -hmm. um, over time, and I think it's important. Yeah. I said in on a planning board meeting last night that I thought was going to be about the project where we might get the in lieu, but actually the planning board or the developer said, "Oh, can we? What do they call it? Continue this to later." Mm -hmm. So they had a whole meeting with hardly anything to do. And what they did, I stayed because it was kind of interesting. So they said, well, hey, Chris, who's the head of the planning department, and Nate, what's coming up that we might be seeing in the future? What's And so they had a whole conversation about all kinds of different things that might they might be needing to pay attention to or something that they had been paying attention to but kind of fell by the wayside. And so how was that coming? It was just like... Yeah, we we need to do some of that sometimes. We usually have a part of our meeting that is kind of town updates, but it usually is well, we usually is focused on particular projects or things that are we think are going on and not so much on so what can you tell us that we don't know about that we might be interested to know. Mm -hmm. And so we had to add that question. <laughs> Yeah, to what to what we what we ask for. Yeah. Greg, your comment. I thought you were kind of leading. You were kind of also getting into a developer. And does the developer go to the trust or the CPC or both? Were you kind of getting into that? Too? Yeah, that's yeah, that that and and you know, and should we examine that as part of this process? You know, I mean, keeping in mind that when the trust was born, we were town uh, meeting, so that there was, I think, an advantage in. Hmm. CBC allocating us money that we had in hand so we weren't waiting on town meeting warrants you know so now that problem doesn't exist mm -hmm. as far as i can tell it's like if if cpc wanted to cut a check they could do it just with the approval from the council um, but they don't i mean their process is to do their activity once a year the community preservation act does once a year here's our money here's what we're doing with it we're done till next year so yeah, That's, so in that sense, can... it still exists. You're right. So then that that we, we still serve that that function. And I guess I, I'm sort of separately thinking though, um, not so much about um, the CPC versus trust dynamics. More more so that that to me is evocative of like there are some things like you know I mean if we're here and a developer already has a plan to to do something in Amherst, right? Like you know, they're going to come ask us for money because they're going to ask everybody for money, right? Um, uh, um, versus like us cultivating a site or, you know, identifying a site and, and just, you know, or um, you were saying, hey, here's a specific population we really want to serve. 
come with your ideas for how you want to serve these people, you know, and, and use this money to serve the, this population of folks that might generate like an RFP basically, right. That might generate more, um, at least interests that might not have otherwise already been active. And I, and I guess I'm wondering, you know, is there a way we can leverage the trust's work? So at least some of it's focused on activity that wouldn't have already happened were it not for the trust. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I think that you're in the position to potentially drive what goes to the CPC even by you helping to initiate and to kind okay. of drive housing, kind of housing focus, it could end up determining what goes to the CPC as well. And until, until Amherst is a community that gives a huge chunk of CPA money to the trust, you want developers to be able to go to the CPC as well. You you want more money going just all around yeah. going housing. Cause yeah. Cause you know, cause they're not, and, and, and the political navigation of like, you know, uh, you know, we've in our previous plan, there was a working plan to try and get the CPA or C CPC to an annual allocation, like an automatic annual allocation, as opposed to what we apply for every year. Seems like perhaps that's a stretch, um, uh, you know. Probably won't get it next year if we get the million dollars, I'm guessing. But anyway. Well, that, yeah, that's that, that, that's another thing, right? Is Or you'll have this plan in place and you can make the case why you need more money. Even more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hopefully, well, hopefully I, I feel like, I feel, Greg, like we do both those or we have done both those things. I mean, the the Ball Lane and, and 132 Northampton Road are examples of where the developer got the land and controlled it and said, help us build what we know you need. And actually, Amherst had told Valley at some point in some way before I was involved and I don't know who did it, that we didn't have any single you know, SRO kind of buildings. And so we wanted something and they went and looked for the land and did it and asked us to help in the ways that we could. But then at the Wayfinders project, the town and the trust came together to control the site and then went out looking for somebody to develop it. So I, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. I feel like we do it both ways and I would hate to have something tell us that we couldn't do it both ways. Mm -hmm. I think that I by creating to kind of some priorities and putting together your goals and uh, guidelines that you're helping to frame some of this work that could help support developers in either through public land or through private. So I think that that you're going you're kind of going in the direction of of I think helping to support developers in doing more in Amherst. Yeah. I think public land versus private is a good differentiator. Um, and and that you want might... developers to be doing both. You want them yeah. to be motivated to do their own so that you're not, it's not reliant on just you or just the town. Yeah. All right. So time check. It's 1159. So, right. <laughs> yeah. So this has been great, you guys. I like this yeah. subcommittee. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have time to, by any chance tomorrow, Greg, to fit, fit in some of this work or or do you need to wait till next week? I believe so tomorrow. Oh, wait, tomorrow is tight, actually. Um, uh, yes, I could do some. Um, Let me reach out to you about um, scheduling a time next week to connect. OK, yeah, or the afternoon tomorrow. OK, Let, let's 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 be okay. touched up. Oh, OK, so do not keep it. Right. OK, thank you so much. Right, thank, you. Thank, you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Very exciting. Bye. Bye.